Jumbo. So good to be with you again tonight. You know, every night I have a special advantage, and that is I get reports from different parts of Africa and around the world of what God is doing here in this series. And tonight, most of the reports that we have, and we'll try to feature a different country every evening. Tonight, we'll feature the Democratic Republic of Congo. If you're from Rwanda or Ethiopia or Djibouti or Etheria, or if you're from Tanzania or West or East Kenya, wherever you are from, please send us reports, Somalia, Sudan, but tonight, the Congo. In the East Congo Union, you know, the headquarters city is Lumbashi, Lumbashi. And uh, yesterday, do you know in East Congo, there were 244 people baptized yesterday. Praise God. And then in the uh, South Katanga field in the Democratic Republic of Congo, yesterday when I made the appeal, 123 people gave their lives to Christ. We are seeing miracles of God's grace online. You know you have a QR code online and you can put your phone there, you can click it, a response card will come and you can make a decision online. Now somebody says, will people actually make decisions online? They will. In fact, 124 people yesterday made it, when I made the appeal, made a commitment online for Christ here in Kenya, and they asked for Bible studies. So we have thousands and thousands of people, but there was one particular story that really touched my heart. There was a young man in the Democratic Republic of Congo. I have his name, but I don't choose to mention it because it's a very sensitive story. He made a decision to be baptized. He walked into the water. The pastor held up his hand and said, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But when that young man walked into the water, he knew that his family was going to disown him. They told him that if you are baptized, never come home again. You'll walk the streets. And this young man, as he was baptized, the pastor embraced him. And the pastor told him after his baptism, I will become your father and I will sponsor you to university. And this young man today will be attending Philip Lemon University in Lombashi, sponsored by the pastor there of that church who baptized him. You know, when we step out for Christ, very often there may be a struggle. A, a wife may be waiting for her husband. A husband may be waiting for his wife. Children may be waiting for their parents. But wife, as you step out, God is going to use you to reach your husband. But if you don't step out for Christ, your husband's not going to think that you take faith seriously. And husband, if you step out for Christ, it was the way, way in our family, my father stepped out for Christ first. My mother was a Catholic. Each of the children were Catholic. I was baptized second. Then my mother, my older sister, then my other sisters. But had dad never stepped out for Jesus, we would not have seen that example. So if you're considering stepping out for Christ to be baptized, but something is holding you back because of family, you step out, be the example to your family, and God will bless you specially. Now I know that many of you are watching our programs online. If you're watching online, it's hard for me to hand this gift to you online. But if you are here tonight, and you're a special guest, or you're a, a visitor, not a member of this church, but you're here online, I want to share with you one of the books that really changed my life when I was studying the Word of God from a Catholic faith to become an Adventist. And it's called The Great Controversy. I really want you, if you're here tonight as a guest, to have one of these copies. Would you just raise your hand as a, if you're a guest here tonight? Just raise your hand. Ushers, look for those whose hands are raised. Please give them this personal, special gift from Pastor Mark. We want you to have this. It'll bless your soul. So just lift your hand tonight. Many, many hands are around. Ushers, please put this book in their hands. 
If you are in the Nairobi area, I know, you know, when you've worked all day, it's easy to sit in front of the television and watch the program online. But I want you to encourage you to come to this church. We have plenty of seating room here during the week. On the Sabbaths, of course, we're packed. But if you're any place in Nairobi, there's a blessing to watch online, but there's a double blessing if you come in person. What do you say, folk? Do we get a double blessing if we come in person? We do. Now, tomorrow night I'm speaking about if God is so good, why is the world so bad? And we're going to have a special prayer tomorrow night, a prayer for healing. We're going to have a prayer for tomorrow night for people that are facing heavy burdens and solving problems. So don't miss tomorrow night. The Spirit will come down through the television, but there's a double portion of the Spirit here. So if you're any place in Nairobi, I look forward to seeing you tomorrow night right at the auditorium when we speak on the subject, if God is so good, why is the world so bad? Let's pray tonight. Father in heaven, tonight we're talking about the power of God in struggle. We're talking about how Christ gives us the strength we need because he is the divine Son of God, more than a good man, more than an ethical philosopher, but the divine Son of God. So, Lord, I pray thee that you'd be with us in a special way in the program tonight. In Christ's name, amen. Tonight, I'm going to discuss with you Revelation's source of spiritual power. I want to take you to the island of Patmos. Now, you can get to the island of Patmos either by taking a boat from Turkey, a city called Kusadashi. I've taken that boat many, many times. Or you can get there from Greece. The island of Patmos 2,000 years ago was a rocky, barren island. It was there that the Roman emperor exiled John. On the island of Patmos, John was an old man, deeply etched lines upon his face, white hair, trembling hands. He was separated from his family and from those that he loved. But there on that island, God revealed to John the great truths in the book of Revelation. John felt in the trial that he had on Patmos a special closeness to Christ. When we go through trials in our life, when we go through difficulty in our life, when we go through suffering in our life, at times there's this sense of a special closeness to Jesus. Christianity does not promise that we'll never have any problems. Jesus did not say, come to me and there'll be no tribulation. He said, come to me and I'll be with you in the tribulations of life. He said, lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. So John wrote in Revelation 1, verse 9 and 10. He said, I, John, your brother and companion in tribulation and the kingdom and patience of Jesus. I was on the island of Patmos for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. John says, I am your companion in tribulation. When we go through tribulation, when we go through suffering, when we go through heartache, when the journey is long, when the mountain is high, we have companions in tribulation. Every Bible character went through some suffering in their life, but they sensed Christ was there. They sensed Jesus was with them. Notice what John says, I was your companion in tribulation on Patmos for the Word of God. If you stand for the Word of God today, if you stand firm for Christ, you will go through tribulation, but Christ will be there with you. What enabled John to go through that tribulation. What gave him such death-defying faith? Why is it that these Bible characters could have such inner strength? John writes about it. John tells us what gives us spiritual strength in times of trial. On that island, Jesus actually appeared to John and Jesus said to him, and the words are recorded in Revelation 1, verse 17 and 18, do not be afraid. When you're going through trouble, do not be afraid. 
When you're going through difficulty, do not be afraid. When you have problems, do not be afraid. When you have challenges, do not be afraid. Jesus said, I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Why is it that we need not fear in tribulation? Why is it that we not fear in suffering in life? Because Jesus Christ is alive and the living Christ will give us strength. He will give us power. But notice what our text says. Jesus says, I am he who lives and was dead and behold forevermore. What Christ is saying is this. He is the first and the last. He is eternal. He never had a beginning and never will have an ending. The Jesus we serve is not simply a good teacher, although he is a good teacher. He's not simply a philosopher, although he is a philosopher. He's not simply a religious man, although he's that. He's far beyond that. Jesus is the divine Son of God who went into the grave and was, a, was resurrected from the dead. And if Christ is resurrected from the dead, he is more than human. He indeed is divine. If Jesus is resurrected from the dead, he has power over the grave. One night, I was preaching in the Kremlin Auditorium in Moscow. It was there that the Communist Party had their meetings every single season. It was there that the great Soviet leaders spoke, like Khrushchev and Chenenko. And it was there that these Andropov and uh, Putin, of course, speaks there now. And I was speaking on the resurrection of Christ. And I remembered going into Lenin's tomb and standing in those long lines in front of the Kremlin, looking at the glass coffin of Lenin. And he was there lying in his tomb dead. And I said to that audience of thousands, Lenin is in, in his tomb, but Christ is alive. He is risen. And the Russian audience shouted back, he's risen indeed, he's risen indeed, he's risen indeed. And then they sat down and one man shouted, stood up and he shouted, we want to go back to communism. And immediately the whole audience yelled, carry him out, carry him out, carry him out. And the ushers came down the aisle and carried him out because Christ is risen, risen indeed. You know, if Jesus is risen from the dead, he has power over the grave. If Jesus is really divine, if the grave could not hold him, then his offer of eternal life is real. You see, if Jesus only worked the miracles of life, but then went into the grave and died and never came out, you and I would have no hope. Because we, when we go into the grave, it would be a dark hole in the ground. Death would be a long night without a morning. Every single person you know that has died has not yet come out of the grave. But because of Jesus Christ, that husband you buried, that wife you buried, that child you buried, you and I as Christians have the hope that one day Jesus will come. One day this divine Christ that overcame Satan this divine Christ that was resurrected from the dead, this divine Christ will call forth our loved ones from the grave because he already has conquered the grave. But there's something else about this divine power of Christ. If Jesus is really divine, he can change our lives. You see, you can read philosophy. That may influence your thoughts, but that's not going to change your life. You can read about good morality, and that may influence your thoughts, but it's not going to change your life. But when you come to Jesus, you see he's different than Mohammed, different than Buddha, because Mohammed and Buddha have no power to change your life. But there's something about this Christ who when we come to him and open our hearts to the divine power of God, through the Holy Spirit, that power enters our life and changes us. What is it that gave such faith to those men and women who were imprisoned and willing to face death? What is it that gave such faith 
to those Christians who are willing to be thrown to lions. It is one thing. They believe that Jesus was more than a good man. They believe Jesus was more than an ethical philosopher. They believed he was the divine son of God that could change their life. Resurrection power can change us too. I don't know who you are tonight or where you are. You may be watching in a remote village in Tanzania. You may be in a, the crowded city of Kigali. You may be in Lombesha in the uh, Democratic Republic. You may be here in Nairobi. You may be someplace in East or West Kenya. And you may be there struggling with some problem in your life. But tonight, the divine Christ can reach through that television, through that YouTube ministry, through that internet, reach right down here in this auditorium live. And that divine Christ can change us. The shackles that have bound us can be broken. Jesus still delivers from alcohol and drugs. Jesus still delivers from the chains of immorality. Jesus still delivers from the bondage of money and materialism. Jesus still delivers from religious complacency where you sing the songs and they don't mean as much anymore and you, you fall asleep reading your Bible and you're bored with it and when you're more interested in the texting than the text of Scripture and your mind is saturated with video games, Jesus, the divine Christ, can change us to give us a new love for spiritual things and a new love for the Word of God. It is the, this divine Christ that was revealed in the prophecies of Scripture. And as you study prophecy, it increases your confidence in this Jesus. Jesus himself said, in the book of John, chapter 6, verse 38, he says, For I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but the will of him who sent me. Jesus says, I've come down from heaven. In other words, he was not born naturally, but born supernaturally. Now the prophecies of the Old Testament point that Jesus Christ was indeed divine. There is a statistician who looked at all the prophecies in the Old Testament of Christ. You know, Jesus' life was written beforehand. Jesus is the only individual who had his, who had his biography written before he was born. Dr. James Strange in the University of South Florida looked at all these prophecies in the Old Testament. And as he looked at the prophecies, he said, what is the statistical possibility from a mathematical standpoint that these prophecies in the Old Testament saying Jesus is divine, what is the statistical possibility that these prophecies could be fulfilled? Are you ready for the number? Are you ready for the number, church? Okay, I want you to tell me what this number is. I'm going to put it on the screen. I want you to repeat this number. It is... I didn't hear anybody. <laughs> Dr. Strange of the University of Florida calculated the statistical possibility that in one life all of the prophecies in the Old Testament referring to Christ could be true, and he said it's the number one with approximately 146 zeros after it. One to the quintillion tri tri I was making up a number, but I can't even make it up because it's so big, you see. These prophecies are absolutely incredible. They talk about the place of Christ's birth, the manner of Christ's birth, the, his betrayal, his death, all before he was ever born. Come with me on a journey. 500 years before Jesus was born, Micah, the prophet, said this. How many years before he was born, everybody? How many? 500. Micah, chapter 5, verse 2. Bethlehem. Out of you shall come forth to me the one that's ruler in Israel, or the Messiah. So according to Micah, 500 years before the birth of Christ, the Messiah was to be born in Bethlehem. Now any school child who studied the Bible knows 
but Jesus' hometown was Nazareth. Nazareth is about 90 miles or 150 kilometers from Bethlehem. Why would a woman, nine months pregnant, getting ready to deliver that week, take a donkey ride for 90 miles? Now, I know African women are very, very strong. But I wonder, have any of you African women ridden a donkey 90 miles the week you were going to deliver? I don't see too many hands. <laughs> now look, in the divine providence of God, God brought Mary and Joseph 90, why didn't she deliver halfway through the journey? Why is it that the very night Mary and Joseph came to Bethlehem because of a decree of Caesar Augustus that all the world will be taxed? Why is it that very night she gave birth to the Messiah? It's because of a prophecy in the book of Micah 500 years before to tell you and me that Christ is divine. But the prophecies go on. Every good biography tells something about the family of the one who indeed was to be born. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call Emmanuel. What does the word Emmanuel mean? Help me, church. What's the word Emmanuel mean? What does it mean? God with us. So a virgin would conceive, bear a son, and he would be God with us. Isaiah makes that prophecy 680 years before Christ was born, that Jesus would be born of a virgin. Christ was not born simply naturally. He was born supernaturally. The Holy Spirit conceived in Mary's womb the divine Son of God. And Mary, sensing she was pregnant, became concerned, and the angel appears to her and said, Mary, blessed art thou among women. You shall bear a child and call his name Jesus. How did the Bible know 500 years before Christ that Christ would be born in Bethlehem? How did the Bible know 680 years that Jesus would be born of a virgin? The pieces in the puzzle come together. Christ is more than a good man. Christ is more than an ethical philosopher. He is the divine Son of God. Even the angels sang about that in shepherd's fields in Bethlehem when they sang, glory to God in the highest. But one of the oldest prophecies ever given about Christ was given in the book of Numbers. Numbers written by Moses in the Midian deserts 1,500 years before Christ, 1,500 years before the event. Numbers 24 says this, a star shall rise out of Jacob. A star would guide the wise men from the east. A star or a host of angels appearing as a star guided those wise men who had been studying prophecy and wise men and women still study prophecy today, and they are still guided by the star of God's word, as Peter says, as a shining light. But they came right to Bethlehem. How did Moses ever know 1,500 years before it would happen that a star would guide wise men from the east to the very birthplace of Christ? But there are prophecies, not only around his birth, but around his life. Prophecies that were fulfilled with minute detail and, and precise accuracy that never could be made up. Here's one in Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1 and 2. The Lord has appointed me to preach good tidings to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted down through the centuries. Jesus has been preaching good tidings to the poor. Poverty is not a sign of God's displeasure. It may be a sign of the environment that we have been born into. But Jesus preaches good tidings to the poor. 
He says, I'm with you to comfort you, to strengthen you, to wipe away your tears and sorrow. Jesus says, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you, Hebrews 13, verse 5. Jesus says in, Pro in Matthew 28, verse 20, I preach good tidings to the poor. Your sins can be forgiven. You can have new strength in Christ. There can be a sparkle in your eyes. There can be a smile on your face. Jesus says, I've come to heal the brokenhearted. That man and woman whose 13-year-old son died in a car wreck. Jesus says, I'll heal your broken heart. You can see your boy again. That woman whose husband has died of cancer and she comes home every night lonely and crying. Jesus says, I'll heal the broken hearted. I've been doing it for centuries. Jesus has never lost a battle with death yet. Never once he heals the brokenhearted. He proclaims liberty to the captives. He opens the prison to them that are bound. Those are who are captive to alcohol, tobacco, drugs, those who are captive to immorality. Jesus comes to proclaim liberty to the captives. Praise God, he is still divine. Praise God, he is still delivering the captives. Praise God, he is still setting men and women free. The reality of that, Jesus Christ indeed is divine. He still opens the prison house of sin. He healed then, and he heals now. He forgave then, and he forgives now. He raised the dead then, and one day, one day he is coming again to raise the dead again. You may have buried your loved one in some unknown grave. You may visit cemetery and put flowers on the grave. You may look forward to the day that you can see them again. But one day, mama, you're going to see that baby again. One day, you're going to see that son or daughter again, that husband or wife again. The reason Jesus said to Lazarus, Lazarus, come forth. The reason Jesus called the name of Lazarus is because if he didn't call Lazarus' name, if he just said the dead come forth, every dead person would have come forth. But Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead to reveal that the divine living Christ could do it not simply for one person, but for every person. So the resurrection of Lazarus is proof positive that Christ is a more than a good man, more than a moral teacher, more than an ethical philosopher, but he's the divine son of God. But the prophecies of the last 24 hours of Christ's life really come to a focal point. And if you're looking at the prophecies of Christ's life, they really come to a focus right here at the end of his life. Come with me to Jerusalem, and we're going to look at some prophecies that are so incredible, so amazing, that they possibly could not be fulfilled any other way, except they were divine. At that last supper, when Jesus broke bread with his disciples, he said, one of you will betray me. In Psalm 41, verse 9, now the Psalms were written a thousand years before Christ. How did David know a thousand years before Christ that a friend would betray Jesus, not an enemy? Here's what David said. Even my own familiar friend, in whom I trusted, who ate bread with me, he lifted up his heel against me. So a familiar friend eating bread with Christ would betray Christ. Exactly what happened at that Last Supper. How much was Jesus betrayed for? How much was he betrayed for, everybody? How much? He was betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. Now look at this prophecy in Zechariah, again, five, six hundred years before Jesus was ever born. Zechariah 11, verse 12. So they weighed for my wages 30 pieces of silver. Now 30 pieces of silver in the first century was the price of a slave. How did the Bible know in the days of Christ that 500 years after Zechariah that the price would be of a slave would be 30 pieces of silver? I mean, how could you know that? Let me give you an example. 
is the food cost today in, say, Nairobi, is the food cost today the same as it was 100 years ago or has food prices gone up? When you go to the supermarket, food prices have gone up, haven't they? So food prices don't remain constant. How could Zachariah know 500 years in advance the exact price of a slave in the days of Christ 500 years later? The only reason he could know that is because God is laying out evidence that his son, Jesus Christ, is more than a good man, more than an ethical philosopher, that he's divine. That's what's happening here. 30 pieces of silver, the price of a slave. But actually, the prophecy gets more precise. So I took the 30 pieces of silver, that's Judas now, and I brought them to the house of the Lord to buy a potter's field. So there's three aspects of this prophecy. First, the amount that Christ would be sold for. The amount was 30 pieces of silver. Secondly, the result of that, that Judas would come and take the coins and throw them on the floor in the temple of the Lord. And those priests wouldn't want to hold that blood money, so they would buy a potter's field. That is exactly here in the book of Matthew, who's recording the experience of Christ's death and the betrayal by Judas. He tells what Judas did that was predicted by Zechariah 500 years before. It says, then he threw them down, the piece of silver, and the, and the temple, in the temple, exactly what Zechariah said happened, and then they went out and bought a potter's field with it, and they consulted together and bought a potter's field for strangers to be buried in. Exactly, exactly what the Bible says would happen. The pieces in the puzzle come together. Isaiah says, fifth, chapter 50, verse 6, I gave my back to those who struck me and my cheeks to those who plucked out my beard. Remember, Jesus appears before the high priest and they come and slap him across the face and they pull, they yank his beard out exactly like it was predicted. But look, I did not hide my face from shame and spitting. They came to the Son of God. They came to the divine Son of God, the one that spoke and worlds came into existence, the one that spoke and sun, moon, and stars were created, the one that spoke and earth was carpeted with living green, the one that spoke and fruit trees brought forth their fruit and every flower blossomed. They came and they took the divine Son of God and they lashed him to a pole. They took a leather whip embedded with metal and steel. Listen to the snap of that whip. Watch as they come, rough soldiers, strong armed soldiers. Listen to the whip as it snaps and wraps around his waist. Watch as they pull back the whip the bone and metal embedded in the flesh yanks out hunks of flesh. Watch as they jam a crown of thorns upon his head and blood runs down his face. Look at his back, so beaten. Watch the blood flow. Who is this that suffers so? Who is this with the look of agony on his face? Who is this with the blood running down his cheeks? Who is this with the blood flowing from his back? He's Jesus, the divine Son of God, the one at whose name every angel sang praises, the one at whose every name angels winged their way to worlds afar, the one who never had a beginning but who never have an ending. Who is this that suffers so? It is Jesus. And why does he suffer? He suffers for your sins. He suffers for mine. This is no martyr dying for good cause. This is no good man. He was a good man. But this is not merely a good man suffering because he believes in a cause. This is Christ, the divine Son of God, who endures the agony of it all for you and me. And that day, as Pilate brings him out to stand on that porch, he says, who will you have to the crowds, Barabbas or Christ? And the crowd yell out, give us Barabbas, give us Barabbas. And people today are yelling out, we want Barabbas. 
We want the way of the world because Christ may call for a sacrifice. Christ may call for commitment in Jesus Christ tonight. This Christ that died for you is calling for commitment. He is calling for you to make an eternal decision for Him this night, tonight. Will you choose Christ or will you choose Barabbas? A thousand years in advance, David preached and prophesied that Jesus, the divine Son of God, would be crucified, not stoned. Here we find in Psalm 22, verse 16, they pierced my hands and my feet. How did David know that? Stoning was the method of capital punishment in the days of Jesus, but here, rather in the days of David, in the days of Jesus, the Romans practiced crucifixion. But David knew that Jesus would be crucified not stoned, and he wrote it a thousand years in advance. See, crucifixion was practiced from about 150 B.C. to 320 uh, A.D., and so it was practiced during that period of time, but crucifixion wasn't practiced in the days of David. They didn't know anything about crucifixion then. They, you either hang them by the tree or you stone them, one of the two. But David said Jesus' hands would be pierced. Come with me tonight to Golgotha's hill. Come with me tonight to Calvary's cross. Come with me there tonight and watch spikes driven through Jesus' hands. Come with me tonight and see the divine Son of God dying on a cross, bearing the shame, the guilt, the agony of sin. Come with me to that cross and meet three men, three men whose lives were changed at the cross, an African, a European, and a Jew one from the Middle East. Come with me tonight and watch as Simon, an African farmer, carries the cross of Christ. When God needed somebody to carry Jesus' cross, he chose an African. Simon of Cyrene came from Libya, and as Simon carried that cross, Simon's sons were followers of Jesus, the Bible tells us, but Simon was not. But as Simon carried that cross, he looked into Jesus' eyes and he saw such tenderness. He looked at the cross and he heard Christ say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That African, Simon, in the carrying of that cross, accepted Christ that day. Somebody tonight is going to accept Jesus. Somebody tonight is going to be changed by the cross. An African was changed 2,000 years ago and some African's going to be changed tonight. But then there was a thief a Jew. He was a Sabbath-keeping Jew. He was a tithe-paying Jew. He was a health-reforming Jew. All good things. But he had never fully accepted Jesus. That night, that day, that religious man who was going through the motions of religion but never had it in his heart accepted Jesus. Somebody some Adventists, some churchgoer, formal religion. But tonight, Jesus is going to break your heart. You're going to find forgiveness, grace, and mercy. And then there was that Roman centurion, that European. Nothing moved him. Nothing moved him. But at the cross that day, he found Christ. And they found one who was the resurrection and the life. And they found one who said to Martha that day, I'm the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me shall never, though he die, he shall live. Christ's death on the cross of Calvary gives to you and me the promise of eternal life. The great political and religious and social leaders throughout history remain in their tombs they took the broken, bruised, bloody body of Christ off the cross. And they laid it in a tomb, sealed that tomb with a stone, put a Roman guard around it. But all the Roman guards in the world can't keep the Son of God in the tomb. All the stones in the world can't seal that tomb. Christ's tomb is open. He is alive, 
and he can change your life through his Holy Spirit. The solution to every spiritual problem is the divine Christ. Jesus is still the problem solver. Is there some problem in your life tonight? Why do you cling to that problem? Why do you hold on to that problem and give it to Jesus? Jesus is still the forgiving Savior. Some sin in your life that you feel condemned by, give it to Jesus, he'll forgive you. Some habit that you're clinging to, Jesus is still the life-changing Lord. Jesus is still the miracle worker. I think of John Newton. You know, one of the most horrible, despicable crimes against humanity was slavery. When you read slave stories, if you have any heart at all, it tears your heart out. John Newton's mother was a Christian, but Newton walked away from Christ. And he joined his father in the slave trade. They often came to Africa and took slaves from this continent and brought them to England, ultimately to islands like the West Indies, the United States. One night, Newton is traveling with slaves jamming his vessel. And a terrible storm comes up. The night is dark. The lightning is flashing. The thunder is crashing. And Newton knows his boat is going to go down. And he remembers his mother's Bible. There is no storm so great in your life that God cannot calm it. There is no sin so great that God cannot forgive it. There is no problem so large that God cannot solve it. And that night, Newton said, God, I'm a wicked, despicable man. And he kneels on his boat and he says, Jesus, forgive me for this terrible sin. And John Newton is converted. And he gives up the slave trade. And he becomes an active ambassador in England that slavery should be stopped. One day as he's praying, he begins to pen a song. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Do you know the song? Do you know the song? Written by a man changed by God's grace. Let's sing it together. Let's stand wherever you are. Let's stand together. Let's sing together. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Wherever you are, you may not know the English words, but you probably know this song. Sing it in your language. Sing it in your language. Here, Nairobi, sing it together. And as we sing, sing it as a prayer. Ask the Spirit of God to come into your life right now. Let's sing together. Amazing grace. Sing together. was grace that taught my heart to fear. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear. And grace my fears relieved. How precious dear Oh. Uh -huh.
Now, before we sing this next verse, I just want to read it to you. Let me read it, and then we're going to sing. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I've already come. But there's grace that brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. Do you believe that, that grace is going to lead you home? Now, there's somebody here tonight that you're carrying a burden. Grace is going to lead you home. Somebody here tonight, you're carrying a burden. When we're singing, I want you to come here. Just face me as we sing. And I want you to tell Jesus what that burden is and lay it down. Somebody here, you're facing a problem, financial problem, a health problem. You're facing a problem tonight, family problem. I want you to come here. Tell Jesus about that problem. Lay it down. This whole center is going to become a prayer meeting tonight. And God, this divine Christ is going to reach down and touch somebody tonight. You've got a burden, you come. Some problem, you come. Some heartache, you come. We're going to sing, and you come. Just lay it down. Somebody's been thinking about baptism or rebaptism. You come. Lay it down as we sing. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, let's, go, let's sing. And you just come. Lay those burdens down. Why go home with burdens? You don't need to go home with them. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, just come and pray at this altar. When we've been there a thousand years. Back to the first verse. Amazing grace, how sweet and sound. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved Wherever you are tonight, you can come to the screens. Like me. Wherever you are tonight, if you're in your living room, kneel down. Open your heart to Jesus right now. Give him your burden. This is a very special moment for those of you that have come. I want you to forget about everybody else that's here. And I want you to bow your head. And in your own heart, tell Jesus about that burden and give it to him. Now, if we give Jesus our burden, who has our burden? Who has it if we give it to Jesus? Do we still have it if we give it to Jesus? If we give our burden to Jesus, who has it? Jesus has it. If we confess our sin to him, do we carry that guilt anymore? No, we don't, do we? If we, if we give him our problem, will he solve it? I want you to bow your head right now. And ushers, just let's have a moment of quietness. And I want you to pray. Just pray to Jesus. God speaks in the quietness. In a world of noise, often the most powerful things in our lives happen in moments like this in quietness. Tell him about your burden. Feel Jesus' arms around you. 
have that sense that he's whispering in your ear, you are my son, you're my daughter. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. My Father in heaven, here are my dear brothers and sisters. They have come to this altar, and thousands of people throughout Africa have come. Tonight we sense that you are divine, that you're alive, that Christianity is not some make-believe religious philosophy, but it's opening our hearts to the divine Christ. Jesus, you know each person. You know their name. Take their burden. Lift their spirits. Encourage their hearts. May we know tonight that you're by our side. As we leave this altar, help us leave with joy in our heart, with lives that are totally committed to you. Lord, we leave our burdens here, our problems here. Take away our worry and give us peace. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. There may be those of you that have come tonight for baptism or rebaptism. And I'd like, if that has been your desire, if that's the reason you came. Now, some came to lay down burdens, some came to pray. We've all come to pray. But if you've come for baptism or rebaptism, pastors, could you hold up the cards for them? Because we're having great baptisms, and I don't want to miss one person. So maybe be sure to take a card if you've come for baptism or rebaptism, okay? God bless you tonight. Before we go off the air, if you're anywhere in Nairobi, tomorrow night, another power-packed night. Did you folk who come to the altar, did you get a double blessing tonight? Yes. What do you say, church? Did you get a double blessing? Yes. Would you like more people to get the double blessing? Yes. So be sure to come tomorrow night right here. You'll get a double blessing when I speak on. If God is so good, why is the world so bad? Tomorrow night, a great prayer session again. Don't miss tomorrow night. The Spirit of God is coming down here. If you're too far away, you'll get the best blessing possible through the Internet. But you want that double blessing, you get here tomorrow night. God bless you tonight.